is at 6, only on MSNBC. I want to commend Bethel for how well he has spoken uh, to the, the passion and the frustration and the sadness after what happened in his hometown of El Paso. He's done a great job with that. Beto, God love you for standing so courageously in the midst of that tragedy. By the way, the way Beto handled, excuse me for saying Beto, what Congressman... That's the, all right. Beto's good. <laughs> the way he handled what happened in his hometown is meaningful. To look in the eyes of those people, to see those kids, to understand those parents, to understand the heartache. But this we is are problem. ready to do this. Mr. Vice President, this thank you. Problem. You did bring up assault weapons here. The Democrats tonight were heavy on praise for Beto O'Rourke for his passionate response to the mass shooting in his hometown of El Paso that killed 22 people. Indeed, gun violence was a major topic tonight, and the candidates were not shy in taking it on. All right, my panel is back with me. Let's play uh, the moment uh, that Beto O'Rourke talked about, being uh, very bluntly, what he would like to do on gun reform. Take a listen. If it's a weapon that was designed to kill people on a battlefield, if the high-impact, high-velocity round, when it hits your body, shreds everything inside of your body because it was designed to do that so that you would bleed to death on a battlefield and not be able to get up and kill one of our soldiers. When we see that being used against children, and in Odessa, I met the mother of a 15-year-old girl who was shot by an AR-15, mm -hmm. and that mother watched her bleed to death over the course of an hour because so many other people were shot by that AR-15 in Odessa and Midland. There weren't enough ambulances to get to them in time. Hell yes, we're going to take your AR-15, your AK-47. <laughs> we're not going to allow it to be used against our fellow Americans anymore. All right, my panel's back with me. And Mike Murphy, I want to put up for you what a Texas state representative named Briscoe Kane uh, tweeted in response to what Beto O'Rourke said about taking people's AK-47s and AR-15s, uh, essentially saying, my AR-15 is waiting for you, a rather threatening-sounding tweet. Uh, which kind of passion, in your view, Mike, is going to be more, um, is going to move the public more? The kind of passion that you just heard from Beto O'Rourke, which is really talking about the fear that kids have to go to school, to go to the movies, fear that parents have about their kids having to do drills, or some guy that's a state representative tweeting, my AR-15 is waiting for you. That doesn't exactly sound, um, I don't know, but, uh, you, your thoughts. Well, Beto finally found his message tonight because of his connection to the tragedy in Odessa, and that's a very passionate issue in the Democratic primary universe, and he harnessed that. The thing is, at least historically, maybe we're in a new era, we won't know till people vote, but historically, gun politics are very tricky. There's an overwhelming national consensus for some gun legislation, like background checks. There's a majority for ideas like banning uh, large magazines or rifles that can shoot a lot of military ammunition. But actually confiscating, having the government take guns back, historically that's been a huge political loser in the swing states. So I'm pretty sure Beto's not going to run statewide in Texas now on that platform. It was interesting to watch Amy Klobuchar, who I thought had the best debate of her uh, presidential career tonight. She was careful about it. She was for voluntary buybacks, not confiscation. She always has her eye on the general election. It may not help her in the primary, but Beto's position, well, we'll give him a jolt now, is is at least traditionally a very dangerous position to take for a Democratic nominee in a general election. Well, I think just to, to put a, a, a slight twist on that, uh, that, you know, Beto O'Rourke has said, and I've interviewed him on this before, that he's talking about buyback, that he isn't talking about going to people's homes and grabbing people's weapons. I think we should make well, that but a mandatory point, point. buybacks. Right. You yeah. know, so, so th that mandatory is the magic word there. Save not people's voluntary. lives in Australia. Oh, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I think that that moment is what will live from this debate. Because what he was doing was he was resetting the goalposts in a very significant way. Whatever happens to his campaign, the politics of guns are changing fast in this country. The reason that for decades uh, the NRA got its way is they felt more strongly about it, and their people did, than the liberals. Right. Even if the liberals were in the majority on this, there were a lot of other issues they cared about more, yep. and there was no intensity. So now you have this intensity, right. which is changing the politics, and on the so-called confiscation issue, which, you know, it sounds like a third rail, because in the past it's just been 
disastrous to go there. And there is a deep love for the gun buried in large parts of American culture. But the bazooka argument, the tank argument, the Tommy gun argument yep. is a really convincing right. one. Yes. Like, it's not legal to own a Tommy gun right. or to drive a tank down your street. Yep. So why should it be legal to have these weapons of war? And and I think it, it, it might be a little bit, it sounds like a strange comparison, it might be a little bit like gay marriage, where the politics of this can change very, very rapidly. And, and Jason, uh, I want to go to you on that because I think that is the case, particularly among young people who are having to right. do these drills in school. And, and I thought it was really interesting that Beto focused very specifically on AK-47s yes. uh, and AR-15s, which is the weapon of choice for mass shooters. Very difficult to argue to the suburban voting mom that there's a reason why people should have an AK-47 and walk around with it in Walmart. I, I got to tell you, Joy, Gun Beto and Race Beto for the last two months have been fantastic, right? <laughs> he, he's, he's been absolutely candid. And here's the thing. What really works in American politics, it works with Donald Trump. It worked with Barack Obama. Sometimes you say something that's a little extreme. But if you're passionate enough about it, the American people will become attracted to it. I was so happy to hear a Democrat, whether or not it's actually my politics, it was so nice to hear a Democrat not dance around this issue and just say, yeah, I'm taking your guns. That's what's going to happen because I'm tired of seeing people get shot up in shopping malls and Walmarts and everything else like that, instead of all the sort of hoop and high and dancing and we're going to put together a committee sort of stuff. The people who are dying right now, the people who are afraid in the suburbs, they want to hear somebody do something. Even if they don't think he can get away with it, they want to hear that level of passion. So I actually thought that was a very, very smart answer. And at the end of the day, when we get to a general election, because I, I don't necessarily think Beto is going to be the nominee or on the ticket, but when we get to a general election, the kind of American who's worried about the government marching into their house and taking their AK-47 ain't voting for a Democrat. Exactly. Anyway, exactly. so it doesn't matter. And let, let's play Elizabeth Warren, because I think guts actually count in politics. Yes. People like somebody who is strong enough to say what they think and make a short answer to a short question. Here's Elizabeth Warren talking about the other uh, problem, which is that the NRA controls certain politicians. Right. Here she is. We have a Congress that is beholden to the gun industry. And unless we're willing to address that head on and roll back the filibuster, we're not going to get anything done on guns. Joel, this is very rare that I'm starting to see Democrats make the connection between the things they want to do and the person in the way, which is the Senate majority leader and the Senate itself as a seat of power. Absolutely. And look, I, I spent a lot of my career in the Senate and I have some different thoughts on, on institutionalism. But I will say this, Democrats certainly have their back up here. And I want to go back to something that Jonathan said, talking about, you know, setting the left flank on gun control. And you're so right about that. It actually reminds me of the 2008 cycle and it reminds me of health care in 2008. And Karine and I know this very closely. We worked on the John Edwards campaign. John and Elizabeth Edwards set a very aggressive Progressive left, progressive flank on health care. And that pushed the entire field, including Barack Obama, including Hillary Clinton, that pushed that field to the left. And that laid the foundation for Obamacare and for, frankly, the debate that we're seeing played out on Obamacare yep. in the first quarter of this debate. Yeah. So I think it's important what Jonathan's talking about. Yeah, we're gonna, later on we have to talk about the one thing that didn't come up because it also takes a little bit of guts to just be blunt about what you want to do around impeachment. Weird that that did not come up tonight, that that didn't come up, but we're going to talk about it a little bit uh, later. But up next, the topic of race relations was a major point of discussion in tonight's debate, and the candidates zeroed in on one person who they held to blame for the declining state of it, and that would be Donald I plan on focusing on our common issues, our common hopes and desires, and in that way unifying our country, winning this election, and turning the page for America. And now, President Trump, you can go back to watching Fox News.